So now we can move on to building the kernel. And again, as I said at the beginning, that I'm doing this as if I just built all of Linux from scratch, 12.0, and I'm at this point where I'm going to build the kernel now. So one thing I've got to remember is to go back to my true environment. And as you can see, I'm in that environment now and I'm going to carry on with the build as normal. And when we come to the appropriate place, we'll be putting the uh, networking information that we've found. So first of all is to extract the kernel. And I'm just going to use the default settings. So the default kernel, nothing magical about this. So I'm going to do make MR proper, like it says to do in the book before we do anything. Then I'm going to use make def config, which creates a default um, kernel configuration based on the current architecture in use. Um, there's some information about that in this box here. Uh, where is it? Yep, there. Um, and then if I do make menu config, we can go through and just check these settings here that it recommends to make sure that the Linux and Scratch system works okay. So let's go into general setup first. We've got to remove the compile kernel with warnings as errors. So remove that. Then we're going to CPU task time and stats accounting. Remove, oh sorry, add pressure stall information tracking and make sure the required boot parameter is not enabled. So that's okay. Go back up one. Make sure the enable kernel headers is not set, which it isn't. Then we're looking for control group support. So that's already set. And underneath that, we need to set the memory controller setting, which is that one. And then configure standard kernel features, expert users. We've got to turn that one off. That one there. So that's already off. So that's OK. So I'll go back to the top menu. Next, we want processor type and features. And we want to ensure build a relocatable kernel is enabled. So I'll look down for that. I think that's near the bottom. Yep, there it is. Right, so it's already forced set or forced into the kernel by some, some other option, which is why it's got those two dashes next to the star rather than the square brackets. And randomize the address of the kernel image KASLR. That's already set as well, so that's okay. So let's go back and we'll go next to general dependent architecture dependent options. And we want to ensure stack protection buffer overload overflow detection is set, which it is, and strong stack protector is set, so that's okay. Now we go to device drivers. Generic driver options, support for your event helper unset, which it is, maintain a dev temp fs file system to mount at dev, which is set, it already is, and the auto mount dev temp fs is already set as well, so that's okay. Now we go to graphic support, which is about halfway down, there it is. Support for uEvent helper should be unchecked. Uh, sorry, frame buffer devices, frame buffer devices near the bottom, I think. Yep, there it is. We go into that one. Enable support for frame buffer, buffer devices. Go back. Console display 
driver support ensured a frame buffer console support and again that's already been forced on by something else uh, one other thing you might want to do is just check that boot up logo to get some penguins up for every core you've got on the system boot up not necessary but nice to have so that's that then it says for 64 bit we need to enable these if you're doing 32 bit then it's just that one option if you've got more than four gigabytes of ram um, but for 64 bit it says to do this in a particular order to ensure that the options appear um, otherwise you'll be just hunting for x to apic and you won't see it because these haven't been enabled first of all so if you're using menu config enable them in the order of pci sorry config pci msi first so that's that one there so we need to go to pci support first which is under the device drivers so we're in device driver still uh, pci support is at the top so let's go to the top there's pci support message signaled interrupts well it's already forced on for us by something again so that's okay Back up one, go down to IO MMU hardware support. That's quite close to the bottom, as I remember. In fact, I'm going to jump right down and look upwards would be quicker. There it is there, IO MMU hardware support and support for interrupt mapping we want. Which is that one there. I think I've before check the wrong one on this screen so there's some similar named ones there so just check that that is the right one and now we can do processor type and features support x2 apic so back to the top menu processor type and features support x2 apic that one there so that's everything as far as the LFS book wants us to set. So I'm going to exit this to write it to the config and then go back into menu config. And the first thing I'm going to do is to search for our first module, which was E1000E. And you can see straight away there, it's found that particular driver and it's already set by the looks of it. It's already set to yes. So that's a default, and it's probably because it's a very common uh, network interface. So again, that's another another reason for using wired networking if you can. Um, it tends to be that um, certain network adapters, due, due to their ubiquity, uh, are already set in this default kernel. And there's no further work to be done. Um, but if that didn't exist there, then... Um, you'd have to set it because I know it's uh, well it's not a 100 megabit speed interface I can actually get rid of that one and because I know it's not on a PCI bus it's actually on a PCI Express bus I could also get rid of that one as well so that's all I need for the Ethernet now I'm going to search for the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi um, well, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to the, go to the Beyond Linux from scratch manual because there's some extra information about configuring the kernel for wireless in the uh, BLFS book. So if I type, type in wireless, search for wireless in the contents, you can see there's this um, page here, configuring the Linux kernel from wireless. So let's go to that and carry on as we were with the um, main kernel settings and set the wireless up as per the BLFS book just like we just did for the LFS book. So the first thing we've got from the top level menu is networking support. Well I presume it should already be set because we've just set the Intel Ethernet adapter um, so it must already be set. Yes there it is there. So we'll go into that and we've got to make sure that wireless is set. Well, it's already forced on by something uh, through the, def, the default config. And we need to set this here now. Um,
yeah. Let me just get this link up here about reading about firmware. Uh, right, I can't actually. Yes, that's what it is, this bit here. Um, so here it says that we can set these two options either as built in, which is the star, or as a module, which is the M. Now, generally with Wi Fi, I found that, uh, and to some extent with wired Ethernet, some generally it's okay to build everything in. Some Ethernet adapters require the driver to be set to a module. I think I've got one um, machine which has to have the Ethernet driver set as a module. It doesn't work or doesn't get enabled properly if it's set uh, to, build, to be built in to the kernel. So it has to be set to a module. With wireless, I've found that it's the case that most wireless uh, drivers tend to work better if they're set as a module. So what I tend to do is initially set everything on as module if I'm not sure whether it's going to work or not. Once I've found that it's working, um, not only can I see that it's working because that module's been loaded, I can use LS mod to see the module loaded. I then go and try it to see if I can build it in. Um, and if it doesn't work, then I'll revert it back to module. If it does stay, uh, if it does work as built in, I'll leave it as built in because that's my preference to build things in. So, although it's got the option here, I would recommend to build uh, the wireless driver as a module and therefore um, also build in. Uh, sorry, also build this these two options as modules. Another reason being. Uh, as it says here, which we will come to in a short while, some um, devices need firmware to be loaded and almost all, uh, well, no, sorry, not almost all, uh, a lot of wireless devices need firmware to work. A lot of the time they'll work without firmware, but you'll get messages saying that firmware is not found in the kernel. And what tends to happen, this that, that firmware might enable some feature or might enable a faster connection, for example. So, if it's complaining that firmware is missing, uh, the best thing is to install firmware. But to ensure that these um, this firmware is loaded correctly, and for wireless you'll need these regulatory files to be loaded, it does recommend that the CFG80211 driver needs to be set as a module for those firmware files to be loaded correctly. So there's two reasons to ensure that you load your wireless as a module and specifically to set this option here as a as a module this CFG80211 so as I say although it's got there that you can set it as built in my advice and as you'll see with the firmware um, is it's best to set it as a module so I'm going to press M there to sorry go back to the screen set it press M there on the keyboard to set that CFG80211 uh, as a module and you'll, you, I don't know if you noticed but by me pressing M in that option it automatically changed this next option to an M as well which is this option here. So that's that part taken off, uh, taken care of. So the other bit we need to go to that's the actual networking infrastructure within the kernel. The other bit we've got to do, perhaps the most important bit apart from the infrastructure, is setting up the device driver. So we'll come back out of that to the top level menu and into the device drivers menu. Now we go down to network device support, which is here. And we need to ensure the wireless LAN option is set, which is somewhere down here. There it is, or it's also already got a star built into a uh, in it so it's already going to be built in it's in square brackets so that is the only option it's the angular brackets where you can set it to a module or, 
or built in. So this is either built in or not built in this option. So we'll go into wireless LAN and you can see it's got several uh, different uh, manufacturers if you like selected but no specific um, no specific devices um, have been actually set so it could be that for example um, oh actually that one's already set there interestingly it could be that for example microchip devices that's enough to get any microchip device working um, it could be with some of these they're just like markers to display what other options there are underneath that um, whatever you choose you could go around and remove these um, but in this investigating or investigating yeah in this research stage if you like it might be worth just leaving them there until you know you've got something working and then you can come back and remove all this uh, detritus if you like this stuff that's not necessary uh, for, for your particular hardware so let's go and you can either do a search with forward slash again and we can type in rtl 8192cu because that's the driver we found we needed or the module rather and you can see we can jump directly to it by pressing one um, or we can go through that menu just go down to real tech devices and it will be under this menu here 8192 CU it's this one at the bottom so either way you could have done it I'll do that again RTL 8192 CU there it is there it's found it you can see it's set to no press one and it highlights immediately the option that we've looked for the the, the module that we've looked for so I'll just go back to where we were so all I need to do there is to type M to enable it as a module in the kernel debugging output for the RTL Wi-Fi driver family yeah that's probably a good idea at this moment while we're trying to get the hardware working again once you've got the hardware working you could probably turn that off and save a lot of stuff being put to the out to the kernel uh, message uh, system that will just probably bung, bung up other messages. Uh, sometimes it's worth doing help on these to get more information. Um, nothing really particular here, but you can see this information looks quite similar to what we found on that uh, kernel driver database. And it confirms that the module will be called RTL8192CU, which is what we want. So I'll exit that. It looks all good so far. Come right out, save those settings and go back to building the kernel. Um, oh yeah, there's one other option here. If you've got an NVMe device, it's actually reminding you there that you'll need that built in. Otherwise the system definitely won't boot because there won't be any support for the, your your boot hard, your, yeah, your storage device if you like what you're booting from. There's some explanation there about the kernel options, the extra kernel options for Linux from scratch. So what I'm going to do now is to build this and uh, oops, when that's finished, <clears throat> I'll come back and carry on with the build uh, and the installation of the kernel.
Okay, so that's the kernel installed. Um, yeah, we've installed the modules. There's some information here about loading modules. Um, if you've got, I presume, devices with the same, or sort of several devices that rely on a module. And now we use grub to set up the boot process. So there's a warning here about using grub can render your system not all well because I've started with a disk that was empty and Linux and Scratch is the only system on it that shouldn't be a problem. There's some information here about um, creating a rescue disk. Um, I must admit I never tried this um, basically because I always use the host system that I've booted from if I need to um, have a rescue system because basically it's got tools that are need uh, that you'd need in a rescue system um, if we were to uh, oh, another thing is you need to go to BLFS to install some software and so on to get this to work um, another thing is if, if you're just creating a rescue system if you're doing it from scratch um, system or is it a grub rescue oh it's a grub rescue system yeah it's going to be a minimal rescue system so I'm not really sure there's any benefit myself, although it's good that that information is in the book. Um, it makes the book more complete. So all we need to do is run this to install Grub. Now, because I've got a GPT-based partitioning system rather than um, a normal DOS-based MBR system, I need to add this in. Because although I'm not booting with UEFI, um, I have actually used a GPT system. That that extra bit is needed to allow Grub to complete correctly. And that's installed correctly. No error reported. I'll copy this grub config as a template and I'm going to start editing this now um, because it won't work. It'd be very lucky if it did work as it is. There's a chance that you've set the system up the same way but uh, very unlikely. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove the forward slash boot because I've got a separate boot partition the kernel image is actually within the root uh, of that partition um, it only becomes uh, in the boot directory when it's mounted on the root file system but on its own as Grub would see it it's in the root partition as it's in its own separate partition uh, it's in the root of the file system of that partition because it's in its own partition the next thing I'm going to do is to um, remove this line because I'm trying to get into the habit of using UUIDs. Um, it can be much more, although they're a bit more complicated to set up, they're much more flexible if uh, hard drive uh, allocations change. So what I need to do is to copy this in here. I'll save that as it is and I need to do block ID slash dev slash sda star to find out the uuid of the partition where the kernel is installed so it's in the boot partition the boot partition is the first partition so i need to copy that uuid there and paste it into the grub config file there and the next thing i need to do is to modify the root partition and the root partition has the word part UUID followed by the partition UUID rather than the file system UUID. So for the boot, sorry, for the, yes, for the boot partition, I use this UUID here, which is the file system UUID. For, to actually access the partition, itself rather than using the file system UUID I need to refer to the partition UUID which is this one here for the 
uh, root file system or the root partition rather so now I've copied that I'll go back in here go back to insert mode and just paste that in there and that should be all I need to set up there So in theory, that's the end. All I need to do is to, well, just do these last few bits. Echo the version number of LFS to the LFS release file. It's handy if you keep an image, which you might want to do. Uh, you might want to use this image to work with or even use it as a host in the future for another uh, Linux from scratch build which is quite possible so I'll just add in my name to that one and also to the OS release that's that done A bit there about getting counted we've seen before and now I'm just going to reboot the system. So log out. Um, I'll just unmount everything in LFS. Okay, I've got a okay, I'm not sure why that's Quite sure what that's um, being held there. Oh, well, that might be a USB. I've got plugged in a USB drive, uh, which I'd use to set up this demo. Let's try that now. No, it's still not doing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just type reboot. I'll unplug the live USB operating system, the Gen 2 Live USB, make sure we don't boot from that and hopefully this will boot. Okay, so let me just resync the screen so that we can see the Yep, there's the uh, grab menu, so I'm now going to press enter on that, start the boot, and just resyncing the screen, right, yeah, so there are, it's, uh, it's booted up, okay, so straight away you can see that without any further configuration, because we've already done the network configuration as part of LFS for the Ethernet, um, without any further configuration, the um, Ethernet connection has been brought up. And to prove it's working, let me log in. To prove it's working, I'll contact the gateway. And that proves that we've got a link to the gateway. Uh, so that, that interface is working fine. We can do IP config uh, on its own. Sorry, IF config. And you can see that it's up. And you can see the number of packets it's sent and received, and the number of bytes as well. You can also do IPA. And you can see there is their ENO and the IP address. So that's the. Um, Ethernet done uh, and you can see why I like Ethernet so, so much it's just simple it's there it's working there's nothing else to do I could be on my way now doing other stuff but with the Wi-Fi stuff we've still got a lot of work to do to get it fully working now with the IF config command if you do IF config minus A that will show all the 
interfaces that are available and you can see there's one there called WLAN so that's the name of the Wi-Fi interface that we've got to use to uh, configure this to get it to work um, you can see that all the stats are zero because it's not actually working it's not connected to anything it's not configured it's not enabled and in fact the if it's possible if you do use a dongle um, and you're in the market for buying one try and get one with a little LED light on it that light up, lights up when it's enabled because the one I've got has a little blue light that comes on when it's active or when the when the uh, hardware's um, operational and it's quite useful um, to see that light knowing that the hardware's uh, enabled correctly that you know, if you can't get something working, you notice something on the software side of things rather than the hardware side of things. So it'd be quite useful for tracking down uh, problems if you're fault finding. So anyway, yeah, the USB dongle light is off, so it tells me it's not active. Um, also, we can do IPA again. I think you might have seen it already. Yeah, there it is there. WLAN again. It's appeared there with all the stats about it, and you can see it says down there. So it's not active at all. Um, so the next thing I think we'll probably do is to do a um, LS mod, list the modules. And you can see that the modules for the uh, Wi-Fi have actually been loaded so that's good as well because that means that the kernels identified the hardware and it's tied up the hardware with the driver that we set in the kernel um, so that's that's promising as well that that shows that the kernel understands the hardware recognizes it and effectively it's working within the kernel it's just not working in the user land which makes sense because we've configured the kernel but we now know we've configured it right because those kernels, uh, sorry, those drivers of um, or modules have automatically been loaded. So that that's good. So yes, the next bit we've got to do now is to um, enable the user space part of it. Now, because we're in a basic LFS system, there's nothing we can use to browse the network there's no graphical interface or anything so the best thing to do now is to reboot back into the uh, host environment the gen 2 live usb to do the rest of the configuration so i'll come out of this uh, control d and just do control alt delete and boot back into the Gen2 Live system to install some of the user space software and do the rest of the configurations there as well.